Hello and welcome to World Inside, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, Thailand's King Pumipun Andunyade has died in hospital at the age of 88. The king was loved by his people, respected around the world, and will be remembered as a man of peace. In other news, Chinese President Xi Jinping is making a visit to Cambodia and Bangladesh to establish stronger economic and strategic ties. Our panelists will discuss how Xi's Belt and Road initiatives can benefit China's closest neighbors. And Chinese Americans are up in arms over a recent Fox News story that mocked their heritage. Was the story just locker room humor or proof that racism is still a big problem? in the United States. We begin tonight's show with sad news from Thailand. King Pumipum Adunyade has died at the age of 88. Known as a pillar of stability, the king experienced a 90 military coup and more than 50 cabinet changes during his time on the throne. Our panelists will discuss King Pumipum's legacy, but first, this background story. King Bumibon Adulyadej was the longest reigning monarch of this century. And while his reign was marked by great change in Thailand, the devotion of his people remains testament to his success. Born in the United States and raised in Thailand and Switzerland, he was not initially in line to inherit the throne. But a military coup and the mysterious death of his brother in a shooting incident meant he was thrust into the limelight as the ninth king of the Jakri dynasty. Perseverance and determination, however, saw King Bumibon breaking down the constraints. Regular visits to distant parts of the country brought the king into contact with his subjects, and King Bumibon confirmed the devotion of his people as a monarch tirelessly committed to their well-being. Thailand has changed dramatically during the six decades of King Bumibon's reign, as traditional values have been challenged in an increasingly global and commercial world. In recent years, the strains have shown on the fabric of Thai society as political protests spilled out onto the streets and popular politics challenged the old order. In the past, the king was an effective mediator between the forces of reactionaries and reformers. In later years, however, perhaps because of age and ill health, the king withdrew to the sidelines as his constitutional role dictated, although there was no disguising the frosty relationship with Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat later deposed in a coup. But nothing could taint the love most Thais felt for their monarch. In the grandest tradition of monarchies around the world, he was a king whose presence was felt throughout his kingdom. Now that he's passed, King Bumibon's absence will also be keenly felt by a nation that enters a long period of mourning and uncertainty. Tony Cheng, CCTV, Bangkok. For more discussion on King Pumipong's legacy, we are joined in Beijing studio, Mr. Song Qingren, Associate Professor at China Institute of Contemporary International Relations, focusing on Southeast Asia. In Singapore, we're having Mr. Lin Tenwai, Adjunct Research Fellow, National University of Singapore. In Bangkok, we have uh, Mr. Shang Pu Kong, a former advisor to the Thai government. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the three of you. First of all, Mr. Pu Kong, our sincere condolences to the pass away of the beloved king. Uh, having said that though, he has been a very much a unifying figure. Is Thailand gonna be the same after this great figure passed away? Essentially, I have to say, we have to watch the political unfold very carefully. Uh, of course, there would be a certain amount of mourning period, as minimum of six months. And then there's again the next stage would be uh, the, the naming of, of uh, the region and, and possibly the transition to succession for the next king. Mm. But at the same time, I believe uh, the Thai characters, uh, the, the unify uh, effect that uh, the, the uh, King Pubipon had upon us would, would have a certain period of of peace I see. that to honor his memories so uh, as far as this is a short duration and i entertain the next question if you have any 
All right. Let's go to uh, Mr. Uh, Lin Tan Wai from Singapore. Of course, Thailand, an important country in Southeast Asia, important member of ASEAN. How do people there view the pass away of this great leader, certainly a stabilizing factor inside the country? Well, I think uh, the uh, Thai king is a very revered person. Mm. He enjoys uh, a good image, a very positive image amongst people, not just in Thailand, but also in other ASEAN countries. And certainly the Thai community in Singapore will be very uh, sad to see uh, their beloved king uh, passed away. I also have to add that uh, king, the, the Thai king uh, had a very good relationship uh, also with other regional East Asian countries, mm. including uh, China itself. And in 1978, November, uh, when uh, uh, the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping uh, visited uh, Thailand. Uh, he uh, managed to witness the. He was invited by the Thai king and managed to witness the ordination of uh, the crown prince, yeah. then 26 years old, uh, the ceremony, the ordination ceremony. Right. And uh, Mr. Deng uh, handed uh, the uh, crown prince a saffron robe, and that was an act of gesture that went very well uh, with the Thai people as well. I see. So uh, both uh, within ASEAN, he will, be, he will be missed as a pioneer leader. Mr. Song, of course, uh, Mr. Lin Tan Wai already mentioned China, uh, both the king and the daughter and the son visited China before and seem to have a great interest in developing ties with China. What do you make from China's perspective this latest news? Yeah, uh, both the king and all the uh, the royal family uh, have done great contributions to China and Thailand relations. Uh, we always see that uh, uh, China and Thailand just like uh, the relatives in the same family. Uh, it describes our good relations, uh, close relations. Uh, the king uh, 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 asked the uh, the princess uh, Sirithong to learn the Chinese culture yes. and also. Uh, Princess uh, Silitong can speak Chinese, can write uh, uh, Chinese articles, and uh, also can translate Chinese uh, books to the Thailand language to introduce Chinese books and culture. And also another, uh, also the, the, the new king, the princess, the prince, Wajila uh, uh, Longgong, uh, 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 also uh, visited China, and also he also re re uh, accepted the Chinese uh, uh, delegations in Thailand. And also another princess, Zhulapong, uh, 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 also uh, knows uh, the Chinese culture well. He can That's play right. the pi uh, ch Chinese ancient piano, and uh, so to, to introduce Chinese culture. I can tell one by one, every one of them is fascinated about Chinese culture. Having said that, though, let's come back to the political life of this beloved king, uh, Mr. Bu Pakong. Let me ask you about this. At the very beginning of his career as the king, he was not necessarily at all a figure that would bring peace to the country. He pretty much was on. Uh, spar with the military. Uh, only later, he managed to become the most respected figure inside the country. How did he manage, manage to do that? It was, it was hard work, and I think he took an example from his own uh, father, uh, Prince Mahidon, who studied uh, medicine at Harvard. He was instrumental into uh, bringing rural medicine, uh, rural mm. development, to every single part of the country. And the, the, the first 20 years of his reign, I, I think Thai people uh, saw his, uh, his genuine effort and therefore returned that love and gave him the type of influence, which is similar to, in Thai word, we have called Barami, and is increased exponentially since then. And he's been a, a rock of the country I see. Uh, just as if Mao Zedong or George Washington to uh, the rest of the world, the king, to Thai people, he has just that. Mr. Bupakong, if yes. I understand right, the king has been very keen over the years to do development projects to help people out of poverty, to concentrate his uh, very limited political power on things, as he said, he would be able to do. How much of that is winning the love from people for him, briefly? Um, essentially, he has a common touch 
Uh, another a giant project that he was responsible to was uh, the water management. He has uh, was responsible for uh, building a 20 major dam that mm -hmm. enabled Thailand to be the major uh, uh, agricultural export of the world. And it's all from his water policy. He has been wise. He has been interpret. He listened to every side of the story. And uh, he was particularly wow. uh, sh has a certain uh, connection with the rural people, and that's why they love and worship him. Mm. Uh, Professor Lim, let me ask you about this. Uh, we have known that uh, um, King Bopakong has been really uh, uh, the figure that has, uh, the, the king really has been the figure that has been serving in Thailand for the longest period of time. But let me ask you, how did he manage, uh, manage from your perspective, to bring Thailand, particularly the royal system, the monarchy, into the most stabilizing institution in Thailand. As we all know, in other countries, monarchy has been reaching a rather declining stage. It, there seems to be quite a contract. I, I think uh, very, I, very I importantly... That, uh, Prof uh, Professor Lim, please. OK, sorry. Okay, I think uh, he uh, very quickly uh, became a symbol of unity uh, for the Thai people. And uh, during his reign, uh, there were a number of uh, military coups, uh, which you know, uh, brought some uh, um, disruptions to the uh, political system. But through this uh, political system, the king was able to become a symbol of unity. Mm. And to the international audience, we saw images of how the generals, you know, uh, appeared before the king and also presented their story in front of the king and uh, on a, a, a sort of a prostrate uh, kind of a position. So from these powerful images, you can see how the king is a central figure that pulls all different factions, all different political factions and generals within the country together and therefore through uh, many uh, instances, right. he became the natural symbol of unity within the country. Uh, Mr. Song, of course, uh, the king was extremely politically smart. And yet the question is, for the next generation, and even the political leaders inside the country of Thailand, what are the most important factors of leadership that would manage to bring this country continue on the path of peace, if it's possible? Yeah, uh, uh, actually there are some uh, uh, class uh, uh, disputes. Uh, I mean that the, the elites uh, and the middle class uh, versus the grassroots. There are uh, some uh, disputes and some power struggle or, or resource struggle between the two camps. Uh, so now I think uh, for the future mm -hmm. uh, leader in Thailand, uh, 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 he should uh, he or she should uh, make efforts to uh, make up uh, the differences between the two camps yeah. to, to resolve the uh, social problems and to make reconciliation uh, for the two different uh, camps of the people. Is it possible, uh, Mr. Bupakong, the king, Pumipong, has managed to do that, but what about his followers? And what about the political leadership now? And what about the, from time to time, many times, military coup? Uh, for now, I believe in the short duration, for the morning, at least minimum of six months, there would be peace. But all in all, I don't foresee uh, any, any uh, scenario that are difficult on what we are living now. Mm -hmm. What I foresee is some type of rapprochement. And uh, Thai, by large, are pragmatic people. And even if there, there have been some uh, political differences, uh, eventually, there has to be some some uh, a dialogue, and and the military would assure of that, and, and and but nevertheless, the military will be a little bit stronger to manage during this transition. Mm. The previously scheduled of election in 2017 may be postponed, but we right. have to wait for some type of uh, 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 a decision that that this government has to come up with to, to coincide with the mourning period. I see. But at this point, I, foresee, I, I don't foresee any turmoil, political turmoil, that are uh, anticipated. All right. 
I remember the king when he was、uh, delivering a speech during his birthday for the year 2001. He specifically said, "As happy as the king, as an idiom in English, that is just not true. Sometimes the king is not necessarily happy all the time. But we have seen a very respectful king, and certainly left us a legacy of peace inside the country. On that, thank you so much for the three of you gentlemen for being with us." Um, Mr. Popa Kong from Thailand, Lin Tan Wei from Singapore, and Mr. Song Ching Ren from Beijing. Really appreciate them, gentlemen, for being with us. Our condolences to the King's family. Stay with us here on the World Inside. Still to come, President Xi Jinping from China is making a visit to Cambodia and Bangladesh to establish further ties with those countries. And Chinese Americans are up in arms over a recent Fox News story that mocked their heritage. Was the story just locker room humor, or proof that the U.S. is still struggling to move beyond its racist past? You're watching World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing. Chinese President Xi Jinping is on his first official state visit to Cambodia, where his Belt and Road Initiative will be the focus of bilateral talks. Our panelists will discuss the benefits of Xi's ambitious plan for the region. But first, this background story. Beaming with new vitality, Chinese President Xi Jinping was all smiles as he arrived in Cambodia for his first official state visit to the country. The trip is aimed to further strengthen China's traditional friendship with its regional neighbor and deepen the two countries' strategic partnership. President Xi met Cambodian King Norodom Sihamoni and visited Queen Mother Norodom Mononaeth Sihanouk in the capital Phnom Penh. Xi is also expected to hold talks with Prime Minister Hun Sen and witness the signing of bilateral deals that will increase cooperation in trade, investment, and tourism. Cambodia's former king Norodom Sihanouk worked hand in hand with CPC founders to build the strong friendship that the two nations enjoy today. China is Cambodia's largest trading partner and its largest source of foreign investment. In 2015, bilateral trade reached 4.4 billion U.S. dollars, a growth of 18 percent from the year prior. Phnom Penh Autonomous Port is 30 kilometers from Cambodia's capital. 80 percent of the goods that the port handles are headed for or from China. China helped build the port as part of its Belt and Road Initiative. Business leaders hope it will help connect economic centers across Asia and beyond. To do good business, we have to meet the interests of both sides. It's good for Cambodia to get loan from China, and we hope it's good for China to increase its business with Cambodia. President Xi leaves Cambodia this Friday to travel to Bangladesh. The trip marks the first state visit to Bangladesh by a Chinese president in more than 30 years. Xi then plans to fly to the western Indian state of Goa for the eighth BRICS summit. Where he will meet with the leaders from Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa. More on Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Cambodia. We are joined here, Beijing Studio, Mr. Teng Jianqun, Director of the Center for Arms Control, China Institute of International Studies. Welcome,、mm -hmm. sir. Also in Singapore, once again, we are glad to have Mr. Lin Tan Wei, a Jiangsu Research Fellow at the National University of Singapore. Meanwhile, from Bangkok in Thailand, once again, welcome Sin Pu Bra Kong, the former advisor to the Thai government. Gentlemen, welcome to the three of you. First of all, according to Prime Minister. Han Sun from Cambodia. Twenty-eight agreements are likely to be signed between the Chinese president and his Cambodian counterparts. He did not elaborate on the specific content. What ex exactly China expecting from the trip? Actually, this is a very important part for the relationship between the two countries, especially the trade. Last year reached about three、uh, uh, billion U.S. dollars, and the China has been the largest investment in the in that country. And of course, the、uh, the momentum I, I think has been so far so good because you know、uh, the infrastructure construction. A lot of、uh, them actually、mm. 
come from China. So I yes. think this time the visit of our president will give new driving forces in the uh, development of the economic cooperation. Fifteen billion U.S. dollars in loans China has been devoting to Cambodia over the decade. Uh, Professor Liam, uh, what do you make of this trade and economic ties between China and Cambodia as Cambodia becoming ever more significant country inside ASEAN? Uh, Pre-existing uh, trade and economic relations between China and Cambodia has already grown, as uh, you have mentioned, 4.4 US billion dollars in trade. And also, Cambodia is also asking for possibly uh, 300 uh, million uh, US dollars, greater export, greater avenues of, for exports of Cambodian bananas, as well as Cambodian rice, mm. and also the possibility over the next three years uh, a a uh, f uh, budget to the to the tune of 600 million US dollars heading towards uh, Cambodia on top of uh, tourist arrival, which the Cambodian media has said uh, it hopes to top one million people this year. I see. So if you look at all this figure, uh, the uh, the picture is very rosy. Yeah. Uh, well, it is not just the economic figure it seems, but also Cambodia has its own political necessities to develop uh, good ties with its neighbors and also with China, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Popakong, from Thailand's perspective, uh, Cambodia borders Thailand, and there has been some bordering disputes between mm -hmm. Thailand, Cambodia, and Thailand, uh, and rather Cambodia and Vietnam. So uh, having China having a very stable relationship with Cambodia, what does that mean for the country and also for Cambodia's neighbors, such as Thailand? I believe that it was a, a, a aberration. It was a temporary uh, uh, situation that most likely not to happen again. And I, I Thailand believes that uh, Cambodia, as a, a small country, uh, deserve all the economic assistance and and, and improve their, their bilateral trade with everybody. The more prosperous Cambodia would be, better. Uh, for the region with mm. Thailand, with Vietnam, and with uh, China. And Thailand welcomed that. Uh, for the past uh, five years, there has been uh, really agricultural revolution. There has been a lot of investment. There's I a see. lot of uh, agricultural products. And I foresee in the future that there will not be uh, any type of political conflict. There have been mutual cooperation in Dimika demarcation of the disputed region and I, I don't foresee anything but positive development from now on. All right. Uh, China-Cambodia relationship, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Tong, you know this better than I do, mm -hmm. has been experiencing quite a period of time of mm -hmm. stability yeah. and prosperity, shall I say. Yeah. Chinese President Xi Jinping has called Cambodia a devoted neighbor and friend, and mm -hmm. he's alone alone because yeah. many Chinese uh, leaders in the past the decades have also called mm -hmm. similar things. Uh, meanwhile, those sentiments were also echoed by Cambodia's king father, Norodin Sihanouk. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this. Uh, he's described the friendship between China and Cambodia as a flower that never withers and will always blossom under the bright sky. And of course, we all know the beloved king of Cambodia mm -hmm. was a poet, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore he always bring out this pre poetic description. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that though, Mr. Tong, what do you make of the real nature of relations between China and Cambodia? A bond of necessity mm -hmm. or a bond of common prosperity? Of course, uh, the two countries share the common interests, uh, even, even today. Uh, actually, when the two countries normalized, established the, uh, diplomatic relations in 1958, I mean, about uh, 60 years ago, uh, that you know, Cambodia was the first uh, you know, ASEAN countries gave such a privilege to China. And uh, I think so far, at least in the past uh, 60 years, uh, there, there, there are some you know ups and downs in mm -hmm. the relation, but I don't think that you know had any you know effective uh, impact on the relations. And uh, this is actually a good 
political trust between the two sides. We share the common interest in regional affairs and、right. uh, in the development of both countries. China remembers very well Mr. Bu Pakong from Thailand.、Uh, back in the 1950s,、uh, King Sihanouk decided with his country to establish diplomatic ties with China. At the time, many of the、uh, Southeast Asian countries did not understand why、mm -hmm. does Cambodia wanted to do that.、Mm -hmm. Uh, then, after China U.S. established diplomatic relations, everybody jumped on the possibility with China. Back in the 1970s,、uh, now reaching a new stage as we understand Asia has evolved. What do you make of this real nature relations between China and Cambodia? And what would that mean for other ASEAN countries? We see Cambodia sided with China on some political issues. We see the two sides are working on economic issues. What do other ASEAN countries, such as Thailand, think about this? I, as I said previously, I believe that the more stable Cambodia,、uh, which emerged from long civil war, and of course, when when that was a problem to both、uh, Vietnam and Thailand, it's it, it's our neighbor that we have to live with. But、uh, for the past for the past、uh, 15 years, that has changed, and in in major part. Due to、uh, Chinese friendship and contribution, and Thailand has also contributed to building some roads.、Mm -hmm. And in fact, that we have to look at the long term. That I feel that the, the more prosperous each country in ASEAN, the better it is for for uh, uh, the region. I see. And therefore, we would not be a burden. Uh, to uh, and and it would stop us. We could maintain some type of independent foreign policy, not to to be overly dependent on any major power. You know, the、that、more we trade, the more we prosper, the less. We fight with one another. That's right. That's very important. The independent policy, as you just said, the foreign policy.、Uh, Professor Lin, before we go briefly from you as well, certainly Cambodia in recent political debates among ASEAN countries has brought in some very diversified voices. What do you make of this、uh, individual voices coming from Cambodia and the overall debate going on among ASEAN countries? What role would that play? I think、uh, Cambodia. Uh, has a、uh, very important presence within ASEAN, so Cambodia will probably try、uh, to work with ASEAN、uh, on many issues. Cambodia itself has a rectangular initiative.、Mm. This rectangular initiative have many items, some of which they can collaborate and cooperate with China. For example, infrastructure and China's One Belt One Road. They、yeah. are complementary. Within this rectangular initiative. There are also items that they can cooperate with ASEAN, for example, in human resource, and this is certainly related to the ASEAN Economic Community. Therefore, there's ample space for cooperation all round in、mm -hmm. different parts of its own domestic agenda, known as the Rectangular Initiative. Rectangular Initiative. There we go. Then Tam Wai, Shang Pu Bao Kong, Tang Jian Chun. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for the three of you for being with us once again. Thank you. Stay with us here on World Insights still to come in our program. Chinese Americans are up in arms over a recent Fox News story that mocked their heritage. Was the story just locker room humor, or proof that U.S. is still struggling to move beyond its racist past? You're watching World Insight. This year's U.S. presidential election has been marred with sexist statements and prejudicial slurs. A recent story by Fox News was meant to make light of China's growing influence in U.S. politics, but few people laughed at the very offensive jokes. I will ask my panelists about the prejudice against Chinese Americans inside that story. But first, this background story. It was a Fox News story meant to garner political opinion from Chinatown. Am I supposed to bow? But many said Fox correspondent Jesse Waters fed off racial stereotypes, mocked those who spoke poor English, and ridiculed the elderly. Speak, speak! Why don't you speak?、Uh, I understand that current political climate has really created room for this type of. 
behavior, this type of um, coverage. And I just think it's, it's very unfortunate that we are in 2016 and still dealing with issues that we've been dealing with for a century. What do we want? The story, which ignited a firestorm of outrage, prompted the Asian American Journalists Association, or AAJA, and the Museum of Chinese in America to convene a town hall meeting in Chinatown. Fox News was invited. I think this meeting is really the first step in producing a healthy dialogue between the community and Fox News. Fox News is a major media company, and a community you know, want to have a relationship with them in a way that's not contentious. The meeting was attended by community leaders and covered by at least one news network. But Fox News was conspicuously absent. Fox News is a no-show here at this meeting, convened after the AAJA declined an invite from Fox News to appear on their show to discuss concerns. Instead, the AAJA says that this is a better platform to address the broader community concerns. We're now joined by senior media correspondent Ronnie Chang, everybody. Reaction against the Fox News story was swift and scathing, and a response from the popular American political satire program The Daily Show went viral. Oh, and by the way, if you're going to be racist, at least get your stereotypes right. Karate isn't Chinese, it's Japanese. And you're doing it in a Taekwondo studio, which is Korean. As for the reporter Jesse Waters, accused of mocking Asian Americans, not a word from his Twitter feed since his apology of sorts last week. Li Ling Tan, CCTV, New York. For more about that story and also discussion about Chinese Americans, we are joined here in Beijing studio at Ms. Cheng Juan Joan Cheng, Associate Professor at Beijing Foreign Studies University. In New York, we have Paul Chung, President of the Asian American Journalists Association. And in Washington, D.C., we have uh, Professor Christopher Chambers, Professor of Journalism at Georgetown University. Welcome to the three of you. Uh, Mr. Chung in New York, may I ask you as a journalist and also Asian American journalist, how did you respond to the story when it was put on Fox News? Well, when we look at the story, we just see this is irresponsible journalism because the premise is looking at how the Chinese community in Chinatown think of Trump and the current U.S.-China relationship. But what you see at, at the end of the segment is really a ridicule and a litany of negative Asian stereotypes. So we look at that as very unacceptable from a journalism coverage. But Mr. Chow, uh, some of the stories these days you put on TV are meant to make fun of things. Uh, we all understand those are collider stories. So uh, should people be really offended when the light stories are about them just to have a blast? Subsay. Well, you know, there is a fine balance between satire and humor. And look, we're no stranger to humor, but we really think this crossed the line. As you look at some of the um, interviews that we have done with the um, two of the gentlemen that um, Jesse Water interviewed, you know, he did not make it transparent in terms of what this segment was about. He did not disclose himself that he was with Fox News. And definitely the people he interviewed have no clue how they're being portrayed mm. in this segment. And again, as journalists in America, we have basic tenets and ethics that we have to follow. And we just don't think this is journalism. Professor Chambers, as a journalism professor, what do you make of the recent incident? Uh, and also the responses coming from the Chinese and even Asian American community in the U.S.? Well, I think um, Mr. Chung in New York touched on the major ethical problems with this. However, if you look at it from Fox News's perspective and in the general perspective of our corporate media here in the United States, this was a success for them because their core audience is, are not Asian Americans. Their core audience are the type of people who would laugh and um, you know, uh, make abusive comments, let us just say, about the Asian American community. This was designed to entertain a certain demographic at the expense of Asians. Um, I think it's very clear that that's what's going on. It's very clear as when you look at the setup that uh, Bill O'Reilly, who was the host of the uh, show, that the segment was in, that the package was in, the setup that he gave, right. and the uh, general uh, atmosphere around, say, the Trump campaign that is being presented. So this was basically um, a, a means of entertaining their core audience, and it had nothing to do with informing Asian Americans or informing anyone. It was basically, uh, uh, you know, almost a hit piece. Well 
on a certain community. Well, that is exactly how the media has evolved, isn't it, Professor? I mean, it's becoming more divided and more uh, pro and con, uh, the different kinds of communities. And certainly this is one of those examples. But is there specific standards that we can use or media has developed to such a stage that uh, ratings is the thing, and no matter where it come from? Is there an issue still of political correctness? Or you have too much political correctness already in the United States that in your election, you should throw it away? Well, it, th this political correctness is, is a weird term. But however, it, when, when something clearly cl crosses the line in terms of, of, of stereotypes and out and out racism, you cannot hide behind, uh, well, we have too much political correctness out there. I think this is part of the message that, uh, say, the O'Reilly Factor, the show that, that is on Fox, mm. is trying to present, uh, where we say w there's too much political correctness. Well, that's a, that in and of itself is a shadow of basically saying we want to be more racist, mm. and here's our opportunity. And they never apologized, and they never, again, you didn't hear, there was no transparency. The reporter setting up the package didn't identify himself. All right. it, you know, it was something that was designed as an offensive piece. But then you, uh, what the O'Reilly factor would say is, well, don't be so politically correct. I think we, we're, we're seeing what that really means. Okay, in we, we see that the two means, other guests. I want an excuse to be racist. The two other guests are becoming as sharp as the needle, as we Chinese say in our traditional sayings. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if we talk about Chinese culture, <laughs> let's go to uh, Professor Chang here yeah. in Beijing. Uh, having said that, though, we see competition between Fox News and the Daily Show, which is the Comedy Central. Of course, they are very rep much representing different constituencies inside the United States. Some even say uh, Mr. Chung's piece this time reminded people of the Daily Show run by John Stewart at the time. Really some sharp comments over there. Having said that, though, how much do you think, even for the competition's sake, that media has to be somewhat responsible for what they put on screen and what they say through their microphone. Is competition going to help us to find the right balance, or is competition going to put us off the right balance? Well, in view of the upcoming presidential elections in just about 27 days, it is re really crucial to talk about media bias and perhaps corruption in journalism. I think with this particular Fox News uh, segments, I personally really didn't really feel it is very racist. I think that racism is a very difficult card, and we shouldn't really so lightheartedly to play play against it or about it because I really feel the racism is in the heart of the perceiver. I think uh, Waters, uh, Jesse Waters really did an interesting job in treading into the Chinatown, uh, discovering seven passerbys and, and he presented us a slice of life in Chinatown which is quite disheartening. It is not complimentary. That's why Chinese is getting offended. Right. Oh, very interesting uh, comments over there. Uh, maybe I should have uh, Mr. Chang in New York to respond to that. See, uh, Professor Chang here, she doesn't feel people should be very much offended. Well, after all, it's just stereotype that people are laughing at. I, you know, I wholeheartedly disagree with that comment mm -hmm. because one of the unbroken thread of U.S., you know, the discrimination against Asian Americans in the U.S. is by perpetuating us as foreigners. As you could clearly tell in this segment, Jesse Water has every opportunity to talk to residents who you know, have a lot to say about the issue, but he chooses to target two elderly who doesn't speak English and, you know, you, and make a mockery out of that. And there's nothing funny about that. And yeah, he primarily targeted them probably because they didn't speak English. Mm. I'm not so sure that's the intention of Jesse Waters. I think it's probably the wrong timing for him to enter Chinatown in, in a time where the, all the professionals like you yourself is not there present. Maybe he should be investigating more and consulting you, uh, the Asian American Journalism well, Association, before conducting this interview. I think they're just, well, uh, I, mean, I don't think they have this uh, very harsh political agenda behind the story. Okay. He is a political humorist and we should really learn about humor. I, I understand your sentiment of 
feeling offended since it's not complimentary. Okay, very interesting. However, there, uh, well, I will have uh, Mr. Chang to respond to that. And meanwhile, Mr. Chang, before you respond, uh, may I also ask uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ronnie Chang, the reporter of the Cent uh, Comedy Central, also responded in his piece with Kerr's words, and uh, which is the you know signature of uh, Comedy Central uh, Daily Show sometimes at the time. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, offending uh, words being used uh, very frequently as well. So what do you make of this? Uh, uh, seem to both sides try to go one step further to quote unquote offend in order to defend in a way. Well, I, I want to make something very clear. The Comedy Central Network is not a news show. No. It is a comedy, is entertainment. Fox News its main purpose is to inform is a news show, right? When you look at that segment, what is it they're informing? Fox News missed a great opportunity to highlight the importance of Asian Americans in this election, mm. and that's not what they did. And you know, you could call it entertainment, but if this is supposed to be news, it isn't. All right. When we talk about Asian Americans and the U.S. election, we have seen some history. Asian Americans have been repeatedly fallen victim, according to them, to institutional racism in the United States. In 1881, if we go back in history, the U.S. government passed the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act, a federal law that prohibited Chinese laborers from immigrating to the United States. Congress repealed the act in the year 1943, but many analysts believe it helped institutionalize a racist bias that still exists today. Well. Professor Chang, I don't want to go against what you have just said because you can have your opinion, you're entitled to that. But the reason, Professor Chambers, it seems that many people feel offended is because there, it is not an isolated case. There has been quite a long past of history about racism against the Asian Americans and including Chinese Americans and of course African Americans. Uh, having said that though, at this moment, it's such a diversified country you have over there in the U.S. Uh, salad bowl, as they say. Will election change the color of the country? Will uh, political cycles put the country off balance once again? Well, we, we are seeing that balance uh, interrupted now. Was that from, from, my, from me? Yes, go ahead. We, we, are, we are seeing that balance interrupted now um, uh, with uh, this battle between Donald Trump and his surrogates and the movement of people uh, that uh, he is, he is you know, pulled in. That is, a, a lot of them are outside of the, the traditional Republican Party. Mm. And a lot of those uh, people are following trends, uh, that these people who come in outside of the traditional Republican Party that are very racist trends. And, right. and these trends also uh, lead towards you know, the history of, 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 of how this country is treated, Chinese uh, specifically, and Asians from all over the Pacific I see. Uh, generally. And, and, and people are resting their, 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 their stereotypes on those old uh, prejudices. Okay. One incident, people could have different views. So before we go, we don't want to end reach any conclusion for our audience. But before we go, let's have just one takeaway from this discussion from every one of you. Five seconds, if you can, Professor Chung here. Well, maybe. this is a high time to call for unification, not divisiveness. Right now, I think Chinese Americans should really consider the bigger issue of how to really vote for your okay. conscience. Put the, America is at its crossroad. It's All right. Five seconds so, for you, also, Mr. Chang. We're already out of time. Chang, Mr. Chang in New York. Uh, well, by 2050, the U.S. will be a minority, my minority majority country. So I think, you know, the question for us is how do we foster um, dialogue and conversation between I the see. different groups? I see. Professor Chambers, five fracture. seconds for you. Fox News only cares about its core audience, and that's really what this is about. Okay. Well. We're running out of time. I'm sure the discussion about that and many other issues are going to continue. Thank you so much. The three of you, Cheng Juan, Pao Chang, Christopher Chambers, really appreciate it. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Inside CCTV News into your search and you'll be able to, to find us. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.